Hey, brother. Hear me now. Brother, dog. Know me. Understand. Welcome to the Sargassum Podcast. My name is Robbie Thigpen. I'm Francisca Elmer. And I am Mar Fernandez. And we are your hosts for today. We're going to share with you the latest ideas and solutions about sargassum, which has become an international challenge. So, Robbie, today we're going to hear about something really awesome. I remember you always saying you wanted to see a sargasso fish, right? Well, well you know, you, anytime I start talking about this stuff, I, you know, I, I like to tell how I was a kid on the beach, you know, right here in the Atlantic Ocean, looking at those chunks of sargasso that would come up from time to time. And I, the, I, I found a lot of cool invertebrates in there, but I was always looking for that fish. And also, um, I'm pretty excited to be talking to somebody about that fish today at all. And um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm pretty cool with that. Um, we got Dr. Victor with us today and all, and he's from the Himalayas of Northern India. And which is pretty bizarre to me that he studies what he studies. And now he's been uh, in Germany for the last 50, 40 years, I believe, or 50 years, long time. And so, um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm anxious to talk to him today and pick his brain a little bit. And so first off, I wanna ask him, I want him to tell us, share with us what sargassum is to him being that he was born in the high mountains of the uh of india and then after he tells us i want to i want to hear the story about the fish yeah yeah okay (coughs) excuse me well yeah the reason why i I decided to go for marine biology is because i grew up in this paradise you know it's, it's an extension of kashmir to the east and uh um i wanted to do something useful and Biology was my passion from from smallest as a baby already. I used to look at bird books, so I was I knew I had to do biology, and I picked marine biology because in those days we were talking about bread from the sea. This is in the '60s, right? So um, I said I would like to study marine biology. I got a scholarship, came to Germany, and uh, got started studying plankton because that was the basis for for the fish, and um, I kept going back to India on visits. And uh, on one occasion, we went to South India with my wife and we were on, on a beach. This is a beautiful beach in the southern tip, southwestern tip of India in Kerala. And uh, it was a beautiful day, there were hardly any people around. And so I walked into the sea to swim and I was like thigh deep and just, you know, slowly. And there were these seaweed floating around. so. Now, I pride myself on having keen eyesight, and I was sure that this was just a lump of seaweed. So I just kind of absentmindedly picked, scooped it up, and still looking at the horizon, kind of. And then suddenly this thing started squirming in my hand, you know. So, you know, you pick up a seaweed, and this thing starts moving, you know, like, what the heck? I got a shock of my life, you know. <laughs> and then I saw another one over there, and I, I, then I recognized that this is a sargassum fish. So I, I picked the, both of them up, and they were alone. They were by themselves. There was not, there was no sargassum around, just these fish. So I ran, showed them to my wife, who was sitting in, in the shade of a coconut palm, and I came back to the water, and I went as far in as I could and let them go. Now, what, what surprised me was that they were in the Indian Ocean, sargassum fish, because, you know, you'd heard that sargassum, there's only sargassum in the, in the Atlantic. Right? And uh, sargassum thrives in, in what are known as the subtropical gyres. These are the deserts of the ocean. And uh, there's, there's, very, there's very little nutrients there. And in the old days, sargassum used to come out of the Gulf of Mexico, be carried over with the Gulf Stream, and kind of beach on Bermuda. And I'd also worked in Bermuda before that and seen all this, this, this sargassum lying around on the beaches, but I'd never seen the fish, of course. So anyway, so then I started wondering, first of all, I mean, several, several things came to, to mind. Like, why is sargassum only in the Atlantic? Because there are other suitable environments in the other oceans. There are five subtropical gyres, right? There are two in the Atlantic, two in the Pacific, and one in the Indian, Indian Ocean, the southern, southern Indian Ocean. And sargassum has only been reported in large quantities from the 
North Atlantic. But I'm sure that there's a lot of sargassum floating around also in other oceans. It's just that they're not recorded. People don't, don't, don't write them up, right? So when I got this invitation from, from Nature to, to write up this, this thing about the, the uh, sargassum and the green tides that were plaguing the Chinese coast at that time and also here in Brittany, so I got, got deeper into this whole issue and I still haven't figured it out, but uh, I did find that, that this sargassum fish, Histrio, it's an angler fish, is pantropical. So I, I uh, looked for its distribution and it's everywhere. It's, it's throughout the tropics, on the coast, it's been found, but there are no reports of sargassum. So there must be a lot of sargassum floating around in other parts of the ocean as well, in other oceans as well. There must be, and it's amazing that now that we have all these satellite technologies and everything to detect it, we still know so little about uh, this one species that is basically forming this huge forest in the subtropical gyrus, and we, we know so little about it. So I was wondering, why is this floating sargassum something special? Why is it different to, to the other plankton or the benthic uh, macroalgae? What does make sargassum special? Well, actually, the, the first and foremost question that comes to mind is why are there only two species that have been reported as la forming large rafts, right? They, they look quite different. I mean, they're not uh, very similar, sort of, right? And then Sargassum is a, is a huge genus. There are uh, hundreds of species all over the world, also in, in colder regions, not only in the tropics. And the, the point here is that seaweed in general, kelp in general, grows without need for a holdfast. So what we learned it's in the textbooks is that sargassum is, is a, a seaweed that can grow by itself floating in the water. Yeah, but grow in the water, that, that's what all the, the seaweeds do because they, they are attached, but they don't have any connection to their attachment, right? They just held fast. That, that thing is called a holdfast as a matter of fact, with what they stick to the rock or wherever they're growing on. So if you were to cut that, severe that, and let, let them go adrift, it would continue growing. Yeah, and you see that sometimes on the beach, even if it's not a floating sargassum species, you see other... Exactly. Species. So <laughs> so all, I think all seaweeds are keep practically all seaweed can grow on their own if they're floating. And I've seen that in the Antarctic as well. I've seen seaweed, huge seaweed, this kelp, you know, this giant kelp, floating along in the in the open ocean far as far from land as you can get and we uh, by accident hooked our instrument on one of them actually and put it on brought it up on deck it was healthy it was really you know vibrant it was growing so my idea is that using these seaweeds that that you know cultivating these seaweeds as gardens as new kinds of gardens in the ocean is going to provide a whole new era in human civilization. <laughs> but you can come to that later on. I mean, this, this is a really big thing because it's going to be equivalent to the, to the agriculture on land. You know, when we first started actually planting seeds and tending those seeds on land, that would be the equivalent of what, what I think, what I would like to do in the ocean now, based on seaweed. So Victor, what you just said about, you know, farming seaweed in the ocean. Um, could that also help mitigate the climate change? That's our only hope. That's our only hope because the seaweeds are the fastest growing plants on the planet. They can double biomass within days. Right? They grow much, much faster than any larger plant. I mean, they grow at about the same rate as, as plankton, as phytoplankton. And they have the advantage that whereas plankton is suspended in the water in which it is growing, it cannot get out of that water. There are very few species that can actually swim fast enough to get into deeper water to pick up nutrients. Seaweeds, actually, they are floating on the surface. I mean, the, the kind that we would like to, to grow, they float on the surface and they can be pushed by the wind. So, so they, they, this wash effect, so they, they keep coming into, new, into contact with new water all the time, right? So they are more efficient at taking up nutrients than the phytoplankton, which are just stuck in the, in the water in which they happen to be. So 
you, you, the, the, the ocean is also circulating. The surface ocean is going around. They call Langmuir waves, right? You, you, you have a kind of a, a motion that is like a, like a barrel going up and down, and the seaweed stay in the top. So they're being washed, right? So they are much more efficient at taking up nutrients than, uh, than even their counterparts that are stuck on the ground, that are stuck to the coast, right? So floating seaweeds are the, 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 the future. But Victor, tell us something. So because you were involved in two, well, in several iron fertilization experiments during your career, one of them uh, showed that actually if you fertilize silica-rich waters, you can enhance carbon sequestration through creating a plankton bloom. But if you do it in areas where there's not that much silica, then you don't achieve the same effect. And so after being involved in, in this type of ocean negative emission technology development, do you think the public is right now ready to embrace, uh, embrace sorry, further research in this type of, of um, solutions for for climate change, or you think it's too early still? No, it's a, it's a generation question. The, the the younger generation that I have talked to, and I, I told you I just gave lectures to to twenty three students, fresh fresh people. I mean, doing their masters. I I think I convinced all of them that we need that we could do it. They were saying like you know we would like to join. I asked you know show of hands, you know on my screen here, how many of you if you if you were to launch this. In, in the in the central oceans and bring platforms and you know all the, the paraphernalia that we would need to start this uh, cultivation, how many would like to join? They all raise their hands. It would be a new kind of adventure. You know, we would go where uh, the deserts of the ocean, where nothing is happening, and we don't hear about them because nothing's happening there. There's the the fish that used to be swimming around there have been more or less taken out. And okay, the fish that would be there are swordfish and, and tuna and that kind of thing, right? But but few and far between because because they are just uh, de delete, depleted of nutrients. But we could bring these nutrients up by installing pipes that, uh, well, I have to explain this a little bit better. So these, these, these uh, subtropical gyres, these deserts are basically 200 meter thick lenses of warm water which are very salty because they have been evaporating all this time and the rain has fallen somewhere else, right? So they're salty and warm. They're sitting on the deep, cold, nutrient-rich water of the ocean. So the entire ocean is full of cold, nutrient-rich water because that water is formed at the poles in the north, in the, uh, between Greenland and, and, and Iceland, up in that area, and otherwise around the Antarctic continent. So if you connect the two, Right? This, this cold water has also got a much lower salinity than the surface water. Okay? So if you connect the two and you, you, uh, you bring up, initially, you bring the, the cold water up and let it heat. Then that cold water at the top, once it warms, once it gets the temperature of the surroundings, it's lighter because it has a lower salinity. So it'll flow out. It's called a salt pump. Stommel was a famous American oceanographer who, who kind of came up with this idea and it's been tested and it works. But now there's some engineering challenges as to how to set it up. But basically each of these pipes would be like an irrigation canal. You, you have to build it once and once it's in place, it will flow forever as long as you let it. So you're basically saying we could convert the deserts of the ocean into... Garden. Oases. Oases is the word. They would be oases in the middle of the deserts. And oases because they would be comparatively small. You see these subtropical gyres, they cover half the planet's surface. Half. 70% is the ocean. And of that 70%, about two-thirds are subtropical gyres. Right? So these would be like pinpricks area-wise. In, uh, in these subtropical gyres. And, and if you were to grow uh, these, uh, these uh, algae there, they would be fed by these nutrients in these so tubes. Sargassum, sargassum would basically be one of the favorite macroalgae to grow in this type of setup, right? Because they exactly. are no floating. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Because they, they, we know that, that they can, it, there was this experiment done or this calculation done that if you start with one ton of uh, sargassum at the beginning of the, the season, you end up with 
10 billion tons. I mean, like, what? The exponential rate of growth is, is, is incredible. They, you know, they just keep multiplying. So 10 billion tons is one gigaton of carbon, right? And that carbon is destined to settle out in the deep sea floor, which would be the ideal place to sequester this carbon that we need to take out of the atmosphere, right? We are, these are cubic kilometers of carbon that we have to take out, many cubic kilometers. Where is the place for that on land? Where is the place for that anywhere else, right? Um, so, Victor, I got a question. So if you're talking about so much car tons of targassum, maybe some people living in Caribbean islands get really worried about that actually coming to shore and Yes, exactly. No, that fear is, is well founded, but you see, the, the the there's a difference because the place where I would do these farms is in the centers of the gyres. And what's in the gyres stays in the gyres. These are the places where all this plastic is is gathering. The the the, the garbage, the plastic garbage dumps in the ocean. Why are they there? Because they are the centers of these gyres. They just stay over there. Whatever enters the gyre lands up there and stays there. It doesn't get transported out again. Whereas the sargassum that is landing up on the beaches now is in the intertropical convergence zone. This is the zones just north and south of the equator. And they are impinge on the continents. Right? Whereas the, the, the gyres themselves don't. They, they do not have a connection to the continents. I mean, okay, stuff gets drifted in, like the plastic, right? But it stays inside. And in any case, once you create a value for this stuff as a raw material, and we would have ships that would be collecting them. I mean, like, you know, simple ships, and they don't have to be really uh, rocket science ships, right? They could barges. be full. Of, they, yeah, they could be, yeah, like barges. They could be full of tourists. I mean, I can imagine that people would pay money to go there and <laughs> swim, you know, and yeah, have a great time because this is the, the calmest and most... Uh, well, yeah. well, well let, let me ask you this. Um, could, could these, uh, this excess algae... Could it be used for food stocks? Could, could, yeah, yeah, could you of course. Well, 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 let me let me get the whole thing out. Could could at this same facility? Could you build uh, something to grow lobsters and crabs Absolutely. and other other proteins and use that for feedstock? And you know that'd be converting the carbon into something else that's going to sink to the bottom. But it could be proteins. You know, high export. You know, high high uh, uh, a high, high value, value export food. commodity, high yeah. value food. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it would be it would be clean stuff, right? Because it's in the centers of the gyres. It's away from everything else. This is artificial. We, I mean, we are we are not tapping into natural uh, wild stocks, right? We we are growing the the stuff that we grow over there. So the, the primary reason for all this would be food security, and to take pressure off the wild stocks and take pressure off the continental margins, let them recover because they are hard pressed, right? So, so obviously, I mean, once you start this, once you start feeding nutrients to the surface, all sorts of things will grow and then you could channel that. I mean, this, is, this, is, this has huge scope and it would um, very early on be generating revenue that would pay for these things, right? And these tubes, by the way, on the side, these tubes would be made out of sargassum. Oh, no, that's right? interesting. Yeah, because yeah, exactly. You see, economy. it would be it would be an, uh, a self-supporting system. It would be sustainable aquaculture. Nice, very cool. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 so it's so cool. You start have to ask like, what are the the disadvantages? Uh, I, uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because you you would have food security, you would have raw material, and initially you could even use this for biofuel. And this would be true biofuel in the sense that it hasn't. It, there's no tractors involved in doing this, right? So whatever is over there, this gets gets a lot of sunshine. It would all be running on photovoltaic. So you don't. The only things you would need to transport to these places, these these uh, sites, these aquaculture sites, would be weights, because you need to weigh the stuff down, right? So we, we, the whole thing would be running on 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 floats and weights, and and the the floats would be uh, pumped with compressed air. That would be you would be collecting compressed air with the photovoltaic uh, pumps and you would release them whenever you needed to raise or, or, or lower these these the platforms that we're using. So if a storm comes, you just sink everything down 20 meters, weather the storm and then come back up again. I mean, things like that, right? It would be all, it would all be possible. 
would you have people working at this site or would it all be robots doing the work? Well, no, I think people would enjoy doing work over there because this is the kind of dream. No? It's a, this, this is the ideal beach holiday because that's what you're doing. No? You're sitting on boats, rowing around the place and tending the crops. And so so the, the, the high value food stuff that, that uh, Ravi is talking about, uh, the, the cultivation, they would need to be tended. Whereas the, the really large scale area the, that of the seaweeds for, for sequestration, they would be growing on their own and they would just be harvested on the periphery. Right? There would be a center with the nutrients coming out and, uh, and they would be growing and pushing each other out and then you would just harvest them on, on, the, on the borders. How deep, from how deep are you bringing up the water? 400 meters. Because that's where the nutrients are and it's cold enough and it's, uh, it's not that salty. The only ocean. What, what, where, what is the, what is the temperature down there? Seven or eight degrees. Okay. All right, and so the, the, you wouldn't need to bring it to the surface. You you would be actually piping the warm water, the warm salty water down, uh -huh. on the way down. That would be warming. You see, you'd have double pipes. You would have an interior pipe which is bringing the cold water up, and you have an outer pipe which uh, where the, the salty water, when it comes into contact with the cooler water, will sink, right? And so it sinks and then it pulls new water back down with it. And that's warming the pipe coming up. So the reason why I want to do that at depth is because there's, there's nothing to, to break the stuff up, you know, because the surface so, is... So, so you're going to create a siphon to do this? Yeah, it's like, a, it, yeah, it functions like a siphon. Yeah, same thing. You don't need to put any, you have to get it started and it'll just run. After that, you take the energy away. Yeah, it's a, like an aeration. And, 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 and you have a perpetual motion machine. Exactly, yeah. It will run as long as the temperature and salinity difference between the surface and the bottom, and that's forever. Do you think it would be generating enough current in the, these pipes to uh, turn a propeller for uh, elect generating electricity? Yeah, no, that probably wouldn't, but you wouldn't get that much energy out of them probably okay, but this, yeah, yeah. But, but the other thing is that this this salty water that you're taking down right that you're mm -hmm. cooling and taking down you would release it there at the picnic line at the base of the density difference where there's these oxygen uh, issues you know where you have these dead zones so if you have a lot of production going on at the top there's stuff going to come down and we will be taking up oxygen right uh, yeah, so you create dead zones, but the salty water would be directed exactly that would flush out the, the uh, would be transporting oxygen now. Yeah, so that, that should create something at the bottom as well. A, yeah, you could have sorts. Yeah. Right, and, and for sequestration, what I would suggest is that, that we collect these algae, compress them into bales, and put them into, uh, and deposit them at, at special sites. That, that are the least that we can sacrifice easily, you know, where there's nothing really happening. We would avoid any, any places with uh, interesting biology and just have these, these, uh, these compressed algal dumps. And the, by being compressed, they would also slow down the breakdown. They wouldn't be taking up oxygen. So they wouldn't be a, a, a burden on the deep ocean either. Right? And the best thing is that if you get into problems later on in, th in a thousand, two thousand years, and the younger generation at that time would need to have a carbon source to put carbon back in the atmosphere in case, you know, because we're headed for the, if the humans hadn't come, we would be going into the next ice age, then we could, you could release that as carbon dioxide. So it would that, not. That, that's thinking very, very far into the future. Yeah, but that's what you have to do. You yeah. know, from no, India, no, that, that's good. Civilizations that we think in these terms, right? Yeah. At all. Well, the, the thing is, um, if you're pumping all this oxygen-rich water down, say over where this dump site is, um, there would, you know, generally, you know, we got decaying matter. We associate that with anaerobic stuff. But wouldn't it that could continue even after it sunk to the bottom? Wouldn't that continue to be an aerobic environment because of the oxygen-rich water? Yeah, yeah. That, this is now the bottom. So the, the, these are two two different things, right? So one thing is where you deposit the, the real, the bulk of the TV that you've grown at the top, right? And mm -hmm. there you, you, you have like heaps of the stuff, right? Compressed bales piled on top of each other. And of course, uh, the, the, the surroundings would be uh, anoxic. But then you would have this fauna, the so-called seed fauna, 
would do extremely well there because that's exactly what they love. So that would be also an interesting site. But the, the salty oxygen-rich water that we're bringing down, that would be released at 300 meter depth. Okay, so that would go In, all the way to the... That to is the 200 and 300 meter at that depth range. That's where the oxygen depletion occurs. In the mesopelagic, and that's where we would release this 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 uh, cool salty water, which would then destabilize the oxygen depleted zone and mix up and down. Right, so you, we would avoid having this stagnant layer, and that could be all, again, you know, it, it would be then uh, moved around as as you would wish, you know, where, wherever. Yeah, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's that sounds very exciting to me. Yeah, it is very exciting. It, I mean, <laughs> see how is. excited that's like, I get. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds like something a, a, an amazing thing to do, and it and it sounds perfectly feasible. Right, 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 mm -hmm. right, right. And I have a question. So, in this podcast, we're interviewing a lot of people, also in the Caribbean, and I mean, there's been a lot of new knowledge uh, regarding sargassum yeah. and how to collect it, how to make it useful for different uh, aims. So how do you think that knowledge from the Caribbean area could be used um, for such a project? Like, do you think actually that the Caribbean area should be heavily involved in such a project? No, but the expertise and the people from there, they, they would join in all this, right? Because we would be going offshore, pretty far offshore. We want, we want to get into the gyres because we don't want to start landing up on the Caribbean coast. And in any case, we, we would be developing the necessary... Um, Infrastructure, meaning ships, for instance, that would take care, that would collect the sargassum, right? And these ships wouldn't require a lot of fuel because sargassum isn't, isn't good at escaping, right? So you just have, and you, you know where it is, you could use drones, follow it wherever there are patches that you want to get rid of, and then you could collect them in such a way that, that you don't disturb the fauna too much, shake them up a bit, you know, like, you know, it's like harvesting, yeah. right? You do kind of, scientifically and empathetically suitable you, 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 you just you just use a big ocean going combine i guess like, something like that right yeah. right well well there there in lake victoria in uh, africa they they have a, a problem with uh, uh, high, uh water high hyacinth distance. yeah the hyacinth yeah the water and, hyacinth yeah and they, re, they 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 are taking this these machines and pulling it out and using it for uh for exactly. compost and stuff Right, 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 right. So that's exactly this. So, so this, what, I, what I'm uh, promulgating here is this nature-based solution to this problem. Because, you see, in the ocean, it was not possible for, for stuff like water hyacinth or duckweed. You know, duckweed is much smaller. Oh, duck, duckweeds. They grow you like hell as you, well. You want to get rid of the mosquitoes, plant some duckweed. Yeah. Okay, okay. Anyway, but you see, th these are the ocean's answer to duckweed. And they would, we would be making them, right? So these, these tubes that we're bringing in, they're like the roots of the water hyacinth or the duckweed, right? That are floating plants that, that have the, the leaves on the surface and their roots are depth, except that we pull them down a little bit. And there are all this, these armies of synthetic biologists who want to do something. They could start growing these things. I mean, they could start mm -hmm. making them such a, see, you'll smile. Exactly, the science fiction, right? But why not? I mean, you know, they grow the they grow the roots themselves, and then afterwards, you know, colonizing the ocean in seven easy steps. Right, 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 <laughs> and you have exactly, and you have the exact control over them because what they are lacking is iron. See, the ocean is iron limited, and we would have to to spray them with iron, and the moment you stop spraying them with iron, they just stop growing. So there's you have total control. So there's nothing that could go go wild here, right? Well, if you, you know, when you, we do these algal booms with the iron, is it possible to harvest the diatoms and algae and stuff like that, possibly, and reuse that instead of constantly bringing more iron? You see, the sediments in these subtropical gyres are what is known as red abyssal clay. There's nothing else in there. There are no fossils, there's almost no organisms living in it. And why is it red abyssal clay? Because it's full of iron. So we could be pumping up the, the sediments from the dump sites and spraying that on the top. And of course, there you, you would need to see how, how we can activate this iron because it's, it's, very, it's rust, basically. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But that could be treated and, and then provide this. So, so these things would be autonomous. 
except for the weights. You need to have weights. And I can't think of anything else unless you put clay in, you know, kind of compact the clay into bags or something, sargasso bags. Because you need to have counterweights, you know, to stay on position and so on. Because everything else could come from the sargassum. I mean, I see here that there's going to be jobs for almost everyone. From yeah. engineers to yeah. all the fishermen in the Caribbean. Right. And right. Going right. to all the scientists, synthetic biologists. Right. I mean, I like to call this ecosystem synthetic biology, right? We're trying to engineer a whole ecosystem that helps right. us. Uh, and that's what is nature-based solutions, basically. Right. It's an absolute nature-based solution. It's just taking nature a step further. It's what, you know, the, the, it, the, we're taking nature over the hurdle that they didn't manage to get over to be able to grow this, right? Because in, in, in fresh water, you could grow the, the water highest and you could grow the roots longer and longer and longer. But in the ocean, you couldn't because you would need to grow 200 deep, meter deep roots, right? Yeah. But here, we would provide those roots and then, then you got it. I mean, exactly. it's nothing more than what we've been doing on land since centuries, right? Like agriculture is nothing Absolutely. Like us trying to use the best out of nature. So it right, 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 right. So then, of course, we'd be then, you know, to answer Ravi's question, then we would be also breeding vegetables, seaweed vegetables for, for eating. I mean, at the moment, the seaweed that we have is all wild. I don't know whether anybody's actually bred any of the stuff. Perhaps the Japanese, right? Because they have a very long tradition. Yeah, I think in in China and Korea as well. Yeah, but they're still using wild uh, wild uh, uh, species. I mean, you know, like you know, cabbage. Mm -hmm. If you look at the wild cabbage, it, it looks more like canola, right? So oh, yes, you wouldn't like you the, wouldn't yeah. you wouldn't associate cauliflower. I just bought a cauliflower today. I'm Indian. I love cauliflower. So. Uh, so that kind of stuff, you know, you're growing kind of seaweed cauliflower and seaweed, whatever. So, Victor, for our last question, um, when looking at solutions to our problems nowadays, whether it's climate change or other problems we have, you o we always hear about land-based solutions. As, and as a marine biologist, I'm always sad that we don't talk about the ocean. So I want to... I want to ask you and tell our listeners, why is the ocean the solution to our current situation as humanity? Because it's it's uh, seventy percent of the Earth's surface, and the ocean the ocean boundaries, right? That's where the iron is. That's where the commercial fish stocks are. That's where all the stuff is that is uh, that we are utilizing, overutilizing, right? We've overfished the ocean. We We've done hell with the ocean, right? We've wrecked the ocean. That's why people are scared of meddling anymore with the ocean. So they kind of say hands off. But the only way to take hands off those valuable parts of the ocean, which are the margins, is to go to the center, right? So we would move from the periphery and allow the periphery to recover by going to the centers. And in the centers, which are the deserts where nothing is happening, there we would establish these aquaculture fields. And then there's huge growth industry. Hectares and hectares, square, you know, square kilometers of square millions, kilometers. Millions, millions of square kilometers, right? See, so I'm, I'm now into, tuned into all these millions of square kilometers, hundreds of millions of square kilometers, and it, it, it really works out. Right. So, the, so instead, of, instead of going into outer space, which is ridiculous, Mars and all that, I mean, let's go and do this kind of stuff here on, on our planet. In the ocean and on the water, I mean, that's what we are. We are 80% water, right? I fully agree with you, Victor. And I think uh, this was a very inspiring uh, interview. And I think we're going to have a lot of food for thought um, after this conversation. And I hope our listeners also got all inspired um, about what things can be done um, with nature in the ocean. And yeah, with this, I would say thank you so much for your time and for joining us. Uh, today and we will say bye to you and uh, talk to you soon I'm always welcome. I'm open and there's lots of stuff that I have to tell and I just open a little window now basically and uh, yeah I'm always happy to share the, the products of my thinking I like to think it's my hobby <laughs> nice nice okay. yeah I, I hope that uh, somebody out there listening is going to run through that crack of the little door the little crack in the door that you just opened yeah. and all and, and and i think that'll make us all very happy great yeah for sure thank you thank you for your patience
Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Victor. We'll uh, we'll talk to you again sometime. Okay. Yes. What's up, Robbie? Tell us what 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 did, what did you think about this? You were unusually quiet today. Yeah, because I was listening intently. I really, really liked what Victor was talking about. I think having positive future um, like imagination and, and plans is so important for us right now because we're always talking about the bad stuff and the bad things that are happening with climate change, but we hardly ever talk about our visions of how it could be in the future and how good it could be in the future. And that his vision is about the ocean and that he has a very clear vision about how it is. Like he knows exactly how it's gonna work. That made me super, super happy. Yeah, it's always super inspiring to talk to Victor and uh, get uh, this big picture because he doesn't forget anything. You know, it's, a, it's an integrate, integrated vision. It's not just, oh, I have this vision of growing one algae in the ocean. It's like how it uh, involves society, how it involves economy, you know, we touch circular economy, we touch uh, local communities helping out, creating jobs. It's about everything. It's about solving an entire problem and not just one side of the problem. So I think that's, that's really great to have this big picture um, view on things. Yeah, well, he certainly is seeing the big, big picture in all this. And, um, and that's, that, that's, I think that's what I appreciate the most that, uh, that, you know, I've heard a lot of really nice stuff that just, tickled kind of like brain shampoo you kind of tickled my brain a little bit really refreshing but the, the thing is he 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 didn't just focus on um he, he, he uh, on a little pinpoint he focused on a the big big picture and all and uh, i think he sees the big picture as clearly as someone looking at an amoeba under a microscope would see that and all and i, and I think that's very important to 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 uh, uh to be a part of a project like this I wonder, Fran, if we should um, invite the, the Caribbean to give a lecture to, to the kids, because we were thinking, you remember, some time ago we talked about uh, going to schools in the Caribbean and, and talking about sargassum and so on. It would be really cool to uh, bring Victor there and let him talk to the locals and the kids there and see what they think about that, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, the idea is that in April, May, I found a really cool family from Fort Lauderdale who has a very nice um, catamaran and they're excited about me doing research and outreach with them. So um, I think their boat will be somewhere in the Southern Caribbean and seeing where COVID lets us sail and the wind lets us sail, they'll sail between islands and hopefully sample some sargassum offshore between the islands, not in gyres, but at least a bit of offshore sampling, because that's something we're really missing. And um, for science, we know a lot about sargassum on the coast, but not much offshore. And then when we are on the islands, I want to talk to the locals for the podcast, but also um, go into the schools and teach the schools, especially high school students, about sargassum and the opportunities. So having Victor with us, if he wants to come on a sailing adventure, why not? Or if not on a screen, we can do yes. can let him see what he prefers. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, guys, um, have a nice week and talk to you soon. Thank you for tuning in today and learning with us from our guest about sargassum. If you enjoyed our podcast, please consider supporting us financially by becoming a Patreon. For as little as $1 per month, you can support us and take part in an exclusive monthly Zoom happy hour for Patreons, where you can network with our podcast guests and other sargassum enthusiasts. This podcast was produced by Marcel van der Kamp and your hosts today were Robbie Ting, Francisca Elmer and Mar Fernandez. We will be back next week with another exciting guest. Do you want to find out more about what our guests talked about today? Check our show notes for links to the documents and websites. The music in this podcast is from the song Demo Prey by Drizzle Roadrunner, an artist from Roatan. 
You can listen to the full song at the end of this episode. If you enjoy his music, then please follow him on Spotify and YouTube, where you can find more of his music. But for now, here is Demo Pray by Drizzle Road Rama. Hey brother, hear me now. Brother dog, know me, understand. Now for them no one be see we get nothing, that's why they my free and no ways front and star. Now for them no one be see we get nothing, that's why they my free. Now for them my free. They my pray me no gain progress, not for them my pray. They my pray me no reap success, not for them my pray. They my pray. They my pray me no gain progress, not for them my pray. They my pray me no reap success, so me tell them yeah. Promises is for money, no take that. Only if it come from Jah, I'll accept that. Not for them me put my trust in and give me setback. Yo, select that. Me lam pull up that tell some wicked that bad mind me no fear them. Anytime them cheat and chat, me no hear them. Me dash a few hearts so for the queer them. Me dash a few hearts so tell them wear them. Not for them a free. They my free me no gain progress. Not for them a free. They my free me no reap success. So me tell them yeah. Yes, me know me have a lot of fake friends But me never woulda tap me woulda have fake family So me tell them straight, me no trust them Me no trust you and me no trust him Fake friends lost, lost bad mind lost in a real life star Me no rate that star, me no rate that uh, Me real family woulda bust a million shot in a real life real, real, real Now for life. them a free Them a free, me no gain progress Now for them a free they my pray me no reap success Now for them my pray They my pray me no gain progress Now for them my pray They my pray me no reap success So me tell them yeah Like, but they my hate and grudge and creep on mine They my move like Judas They my move like Judas Plus, everybody have a life to live So when they give one rash clock Who I try judge me like them chit chat So what them want to say Cause none of them out there not be Now them a free yeah. They my free me no gain progress Now for them a free They my free me no rape success Enough of them a free Them a free me no gain progress Enough of them a free Them a free me no rip success